So this means that fostered by sacrifice, the gods will give you the enjoyments you desire. He who enjoys those gifts without giving to them in return is verily a thief. So when you perform, perform good deeds, then the gods will give you whatever you want without even asking. But someone who enjoys these gifts from God and doesn't give back to the gods is considered to be a, shri- a thief by Sri Krishna. So that's quite a harsh word, perhaps, to us, but we'll look at it in in a moment um, why we're looking at that particular word. So if we use the gods, you know, the gifts that gods give us, then this is sort of a sacrifice, and we actually... If we don't, but if we don't give these gifts back and we enjoy them for ourselves, then Sri Krishna is using the word thief to describe this type of person. It's difficult for us to understand this, perhaps, but in this world, if we, you know, consider what we have compared to other people um, and evaluate what we have, which is perhaps more than what we necessarily need, um, we're able to define what what wealth really is. So Marx and Engels in Das Kapital actually gave their definition of wealth to be something. Wealth is the amount that we have that is above that which we need. So, say for example someone's earning £10,000 a month and their monthly expenditure is £10,000 a month. And another person earns £1,000 a month and their monthly expenditure is £700. Well, you know, we have to consider which is the person that's wealthier. Is it the person who earns more money or the person who earns less money? You know, the world would say, oh, well, the person who's earning £10,000 is earning, is, you know, is wealthier and, and better off. But actually, what he's expending is the same as what he's getting in. And therefore, the person who's saving the £300 a month is actually the person who's earning a lot more and who's a wealthier person than the person who's actually earning more than that. And the reason for this is because he has more money than that which he needs. So if we have a list of the things that we need in our life, for example, food, you know, drink, petrol, um, you know, train passes, rent, that sort of thing, we're able to evaluate the things that we need and we realise that those are our necessities, you know, clothes to wear. When you make a list of these things, you realise that actually the things that we really need are actually basic and they're not above and beyond everything else that we need. We don't need the iPad 4, 5, 6, whatever it will be. Um, you know, these, the necessities are our, our food, our drink and our clothes. And there are some people in India that, um, you know, only have, say, for example, two sets of clothes, and they have their good clothes and then their simple clothes, and they just wear them over and over again until they then become, you know, until they then need their, their nice set of clothes. And, you know, I'm guilty of this as well. You know, you have so many clothes, and you don't necessarily always need all of them. So that's, you know, when you evaluate what you need and what you have, this gives you an example of what wealth actually is. And everything that you have that's in excess is considered to be, um, you know, wealth. There are millions of people in the world that don't even get two types of food, two meals a day. Some don't even get any food. And God's given us four meals a day. Um, and why has he given this to us? You know, we sort of need to consider why we have extra. If, you know, if, they, if we look at the example of shopkeepers, for example, when they close their shop, um, they ask the cashier if the, ca- uh, if the accounts balance. And the cashier will say yes. And then everyone goes home at the end of the day. But sometimes they have to stay back for a little while and evaluate why um, they've got some some certain amount of money missing. And the shopkeeper will say, you know, the cashier's still searching. They don't know why there's money missing. And the shopkeeper's hungry. Everyone wants to go home. They've had a long day. But the cashier can't find anything. And this sort of 500 rupees or whatever it is that's missing will say, the shopkeeper will say, don't worry, leave the books and we'll come back tomorrow and we'll find out what's missing. However, if it's missing, it's not really a problem, and they can search for the amount later. But if there's the extra 5,000 rupees rather than some money missing, they often stay back till 8, 9, 10 p.m. to try and evaluate where this extra money's come from. Because, I'm not an accountant, I don't know if any of you guys are, but um, when, they look at account, when the accountants look at company books, they'll say, if there's any extra money, then it's there to be lost. So, you know, no, money, no other money will be extra money. So if they look at the company books and they evaluate this and they have to sit there and evaluate and worry why there's extra money, there shouldn't actually be any additional money. If he's worried about, you know, this extra money in his business, why is he not worried about this in his personal life? It makes you wonder, you know, if he treats it in the same way. What's the reason for this? A lot of people think it's because they work really hard, but actually what we should do is go and stand on a you know, construction site and see what working really hard is. Is it sitting behind a, a desk all day? Um, or is it you know, heavy, you're carrying heavy concrete for, 24, you know, for, for long, long hours um, in the heat and sweating? And you know, that's, that's, real, that's real work. But 
also, you know, sitting behind a desk and using your mind is also you know, hard work. And that also brings you to your fortune. So hard work is necessary to gain wealth. You need, you know, a combination of the three things, hard work, God's grace, and, you know, your own hard, hard efforts. Um, you need God's grace, and without that, you can't really gain success. So in our scriptures, it says that you need hard work, your own brain, your own intelligence, but also God's grace, and we mustn't forget that. We should also thank God um, as he oversees us in a way, as our boss does at the end of the month when we get paid. You know, we come into work, we get paid at the end of the month, and our boss sees us working hard. And in the same way, we should see God in a similar way. You know, God sees us, and he works hard, and he gives us the fruits um, of our labours. And, you know, if we, if we, for example, worked really, really hard and we weren't given any recognition, we would obviously, co- you know, who would we complain to? We'd probably be really upset and think that no one recognised our hard efforts. And so what we should do is try to be grateful for the things that have come to us. And an example, you know, Guruji says that devotion and fasting and penances are a good way of showing God that we're very grateful for everything that we have. So, you know, in summary, there are three things that we need. One is hard work, our own mind, and God's grace. So if you think about it in mathematical terms, that's three parts to this equation. And that means that God is at least one third your partner. So in the Vedanta, you know, in the Rishis always say that everything that you have is God's. And there's a saying which says, God, this is yours and I'm giving it to you. So if we maybe don't, maybe we don't agree with that and we say, oh, you know, if 100% is God's, you know, you can't logically know that um, one third of everything is is, um, that we have is also God's. So what we should do is consider that, for example, in um, everything that we have, we should give one third of it to God. So if you earn £300 a day, you should try to give £100 to God. Now, that might seem like a lot to some people, but um, this is actually what happens in a, in a partnership. You know, a lot of you guys are legal minds, and in a partnership, that's how you divide the profits equally. So if God's worked for you, he's worked for his share, and therefore you should return a little part to him as well. But perhaps some people will still be thinking, wait, that, that's way too much, you know, um, you've still got to pay your taxes, you know, can we not get a little bit of discount on that? Um, so then people say, okay, well then, if a third is too much, then maybe give a sixth. But then people say, oh, well, actually, we still have to pay the government's taxes, and we still have to go shopping, we still have to buy different things. So then people are looking for even a further discount of what they can give to God. Now, we do have to give God a share, because the minimum is a tenth. So the Swaminarayans say that the minimum is a fifth. And in Christianity, we have the concept of tithing, where Christians donate at least one-tenth of their wealth to the church. Um, so, you know, these, this happens all around the world. And all religions say this, not, not just our religion. Um, if we earn, so say, 100 rupees, we must give a part of that. But if we're not able to give even one-tenth of it, then basically it's considered to be a robbery of all 100 rupees. So this is then explaining why we use the word thief, which is quite a strong word. Um, you know, in the government, if we don't pay our tax, then it's considered to be theft, and it's, you know, it's robbery. Um, but it's not really like that here. You know, if we, if we don't pay a percentage of our earnings, then that's considered to be a robbery. But in this case, if we don't even give 10%, that's considered to be a robbery of the whole 100 rupees. So a thief in the world may get let off in court, but really, in, you know, in God's eyes, we won't really escape, because you might be freed in court, but you might not be free in, in your own actual life. So if a person has a lot of wealth but doesn't have mental peace, this is actually the reason behind it. He hasn't given God his share. If a person is running a business but doesn't give a partner his share and steals the money, then he's obviously going to not be able to sleep at night. It's going to be quite tense because he'll fear that one day his partner will come to know this and that you know, he'll look at the company books and he'll realise that actually he's been untrue. So this type of practice won't really last long because you know, eventually the truth will, do- will come out. And Guruji's got an example of somebody who was setting up a business in his, you know, in real life, and it wasn't really going anywhere. And he had a really wealthy friend, so he went to his friend and said, look, I'm lacking funds, can you please support me? And I've got a good business plan, I've got good contacts, I just need some financial assistance. So his friend said, look, I'll support you, I'll give you exactly the amount that you need, and they started up a partnership. So... The person giving the money was the sleeping partner, and the person who was um, setting up the business was the active partner. 
So the business went really well for about five to seven years, and the person worked very hard because his friend had given him the money, and he wanted to make it, you know, a good, a good business. And he gave his friend 50% share of the profits. Now, this friend of his, who was the sleeping partner, was living out of town. But he was very, very wealthy, this person who had given him the money anyway. And so it was really, you know, not, not a lot to him, the, the profits. But every year, the, the active partner would go to him at the Diwali time and say, look, this is the profits and this is your share and your percentage of what you've given me. And this continued for some years. But after the seventh year, the active partner started to get quite greedy and started to take everything for himself. And he thought, well, look, you know, I'm working 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I'm taking all the stresses and all the tensions for this. Why should I give something to the person who's not really helping me? And anyway, you know, the sleeping partner has got so much money anyway. Why does he need the money that, that I'm going to give him? It doesn't really mean much to him. So he started out doing this and he started, you know, slowly, slowly changing the books and um, not giving him... The, you know, not giving the sleeping partner as many of the profits as actually he should have been giving him. So he was basically stealing from the, active part, from the sleeping partner's share. He started making up figures in the books and started writing reduced amounts for the profits. And after one or two years, the book showed a, a real loss in business. So he started carrying on, you know, but each year he continued to go to his friend's house at Diwali, but he didn't have any money with him anymore. And he just said, oh, look, you know, the business isn't going very well, and, um, you know, I, I don't have as much profit to give you. And the business is actually making a loss, and the, the expenses are way too high, the government's changed their policies, and we're not really doing very well anymore. So the sleeping partner didn't really pay much attention to this, um, because obviously, you know, he wasn't sort of um, too worried by it. But after 10 years, the sleeping partner started to find out that the business wasn't going very well, and the active partner wasn't giving him a share. So basically, that he was lying. And then they basically lost their friendship. So they were very good friends at the start, and there was a complete loss of trust, and... The sleeping partner had a lot of wealth, and the profits didn't really mean much to him, but it was the fact that his active partner had lied to him. So this partnership then dissolved, and you know, now that active partner can't really work without him. You know, they don't, they, they're not really working together, and the active partner is losing out. Now, the same example happens between the individual soul and the supreme being. The individual soul doesn't give even one-tenth the share to the supreme, and this doesn't really make much of a difference to the supreme being, because he is supreme, he has everything. But... You know, we have to take it out of our heads that if we don't give money to, to the temple, that the temple won't continue. It will. You know, by giving a donation, we're not really doing God a favor. We're doing what is our duty. The Gita tells us that God gave us this wealth. And therefore, as per, you know, what we were saying earlier, what we give will come back to us. So we should consider this to be part of a sacrifice. You know, God's giving it to us in order that we can distribute it. And God has so much wealth that if he distributes it, that, um, you know, to the right people, that the right people will spend this in the right way and that it will disperse into society. When God, you know, distributes this, in order to gain this wealth, for example, we must have done good deeds in our previous lives. And God gives material wealth to those people that, um, you know, we'll go on to see this in the sixth chapter, that, you know, people who do good deeds... So Arjun asks uh, the question in the sixth chapter that, you know, if people become to the age of 50 and they've worked hard up till then, and only then do they realize that penances and devotion should be done, and they carry on for 20 years and then they die, what happens, you know, they haven't reached the ultimate goal in their lives, but what will happen to their devotion and their penances? Do they just disappear? Is it because they've done it too late in their life? Um, and Sri Krishna explains to us that no, but no good deed will ever go to waste, and no, you know, all acts and all actions will get their fruit. And Sri Krishna says that if you perform devotion and penances, you will always um, sort of be reborn into a, into a pure and religious family and that you'll reap the fruits in your future life. So if we're born into a prosperous and religious family and good deeds, it's because of the good deeds we did in the previous birth. And in the Bible, it says that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a wealthy person to go to heaven. But the Gita doesn't necessarily agree with this. It says that you know, um, if we have wealth, then it's the fruit and the reward of what God's given to us, and it's the good deeds that we did in our previous life. So this should inspire us in order to do better. You know, um, again, going back to the previous example of owning your own, um, you know, possessions and owning things and, and making them yours, what actually happens in reality is that, you know, when we have a lot of wealth, we sort of become the manager of the wealth rather than its owner. So happiness only really comes to the owner of a... Of a of a business and not really to the manager. So, for example, if there's a business and it's got, you know, a £5 million turnover, the owner's really happy about that because, 
you know, that money's great and the business is doing really, really well. But the manager doesn't really necessarily derive much pleasure from it because he thinks, oh no, I've got to put more effort into this. I've got to work harder on the company books and there's more and more stress. There's not really pleasure for the manager, but more so for the owner. And therefore, again, become the owner of your wealth and use it for good purposes because if you use it for good purposes, you'll be able to derive good fruits and, um, you know, derive pleasure from this. The next point is that um, there's a lot of lack of peace in society today because there's lots of people who want to take things but not necessarily people who want to give things. So, again, you know, the example... I mean, I, I live in Croydon and I saw the riots firsthand and this is an ample example of people not wanting to give anything but people just wanting to take. Um, you know, a lot of times people profit from society but aren't necessarily keen on giving anything back to society. But that's not really a fair balance if you think about it. You know, um, th the best way to to find a balance is that, you know, on the weighing scale, it's, if one thing goes up, then the other thing has to go down to make it balance. Um, you know, everyone's thinking, what can I take from society? What can I gain from this? Not necessarily, what can I give back? And that's something that we need to consider, because it's actually our duty to give back. Um, and that's why often there's a lack of peace in society. This is, you know, bringing us on to the next topic of charity. So charity actually opens up our minds. And when we experience this, you know, it's such a wonderful feeling. I'm sure all of you guys have experienced this in, in one way or another. Um, when you give something to somebody, you know, charity doesn't necessarily have to be giving £100 a month to somebody who lives, you know, across the world. It can be something small, like giving something to somebody who you care about, who you know can't afford it, or giving somebody a meal who, who can't necessarily, you know... Um, afford to pay for a meal that day something small it's you know charity doesn't necessarily have to be a huge amount but um, when you do something like this it makes you feel really sort of happy from inside and it's a different kind of happiness it's not the happiness of oh you know I've just eaten an excellent cake or I've just bought a new bag for myself it's something completely different and that kind of feeling is an emotional happiness that um, you know it's really quite difficult to describe. So this, this, you know, it's an encouragement of why we should um, be charitable in our lives. Um, there's the example in the Gita that um, the river, you know, um, Kabirji gives the example of a river that's flowing and a person who tries to keep all the water to themselves by causing a barrier and trying to keep all the water in their own garden so that their fruits will f um, flower. Just like a ship is full with water, and a house is full of more wealth than one needs, give it with both hands, because this is the right thing to do. So if you have more wealth than you need in your house, start to use it for good purposes. Otherwise, you know, you won't necessarily see, reap good fruits from, from this wealth. Once your wealth is emptied, not just sort of within families, but in societies and communities, um, you know, it wipes out all the, the benefits and the good things that are left. So we need to learn to give back what we have. Now, Sri Krishna has used this word, thief, which is quite a strong word, and there are reasons why he's used this word. Charity is quite an important part of sacrifice. And, you know, for one, one who doesn't perform a sacrifice doesn't do work for God and for a good purpose, and this person is quite selfish. Such a person often lives in society and takes from others and takes, you know, is happy to be served by others but not necessarily to serve others in return. And this is quite selfish and considered to be, you know, the characteristics of a thief, someone who takes but is not necessarily willing to give. Everything that you do in this world is done with another person's help, going back to our initial point that you need cooperation from others before you do anything. If you pull a fruit out of a tree, then the tree has actually done a favour for you. I mean, this is just a simple example, but what we should then do is to, fl is to pour water on the, you know, um, the tree and give it some water because we've taken something from the tree. Um, and you know, it's just a metaphor, but it's an example. If you take something, then you should try to give back. If you keep pulling fruits and tree, um, leaves from the tree, then the tree will, you know, at the end of the day, and if you don't put any water or um, seeds back, then eventually you won't get anything back from the fr um, you won't get any fruits back from the tree. And in the same way, you should give something back. You know, if you take something with one hand, you should give something back with the other hand. Because, again, imbalance is a theft. If I keep taking, then that's, you know, not, not giving um, anything back. That's unequal. So both sides should be balanced. A person who doesn't do this, you know, and doesn't do any favours for another person is considered to be a thief. 
Nothing in the world is ours. Really, everything belongs to God. So we should understand this intellectually. You can only really take some. You can only really consider something to be yours that you take with you. You know, often my mum says, when you're born and when you die, you you come and go, and you have no objects that you take away with you. So really, can you consider anything to be yours? It's a simple example, but you know, when you consider this, it makes you consider what wealth and、um, charity actually really mean. Everything that you have today has been taken. You know, everything that you have today was has been taken on by you after you've come into the world.、Um, your house, your car, everything else.、Um, but actually, this is all sort of belonging to God. You're not necessarily the owner of those things. The things that you you didn't you know that didn't belong to you belong to other people. So we should learn to to understand this whilst we live in the world with others, and then we won't get sad. Once we have a sense of ownership of something, we then become greedy because we weren't able to, you know, we're not able to give it back. So, for example, if I borrow this pen from somebody, I might think, "Oh, wow, it writes so beautifully. It's so wonderful. I wonder where I, if I can keep this pen a bit further." And I get attachment to the pen, and I want to keep it. If, however, you just write with it and then return the pen back,、um, you don't have any attachment, and then you don't have any greed over the pen. And that's how we should deal with our belongings and our objects, you know, without having an attachment to it, because then you don't start to become greedy over that object, and you don't have a sense of ownership over the pen. And it's only when you start to sort of have to give the pen back to someone if it doesn't belong to you that you start to feel sad that oh you know I don't want to give this back you know I want it for myself. So when using objects in the world, a person should remember this one thing: nothing is ours. You know, the person is yours, but no object is yours. No situation is yours. You're not the owner, and therefore, when it goes, you shouldn't be sad. If it's not yours and you're not using it, you know, for example, when you use something of somebody's, you should pay rent. So, what is this rent? You know, we're living in this world, and God has said there's only one type of rent. And that is sacrifice of yourself. So when you do good things in society, when you do good charity work, that's a form of rent. That's a form of you,、um, you know, giving back to society. Often, you know,、um, they they have students, for example. I've heard of this in India, where if they can't afford to pay for their own education, people will sponsor them through their education, and you know, they'll encourage them to get further and further. And they won't necessarily say, "Give me money back," but they will say, "Please, once you've earned enough money for yourself, try to sponsor one or two children of your own, so that this is, becomes like a cycle."、Um, you know, they don't necessarily say they want any money back. And this way, you know, the cycle keeps coming and going. And the, this positive energy, as we were saying at the start of the class, where、um, you know you do something positive for someone, and something positive will come back. So this is how they find, you know, that they they are actually repaid, and that's through the charity and the the pleasure in seeing someone else succeed. And in this way, the cycle keeps turning. This, you know, is a type of selflessness, and this also again counts for for rent. And that again, you'll get happiness from these this this cycle because you're not necessarily taking, but you're giving. The happiness that you get from good thoughts. Um, you should give to others as well, so that you can, en- you know, they can also enjoy it. So this is again in the form of sacrifice. One who doesn't do this is a thief. You know, one who doesn't pay this type of rent to society is a thief, and therefore we should try to pay that rent. The third reason why Sri Krishna uses the word thief is because one who uses things in this world makes them wear and tear. I mean, it's a natural thing that the more we use something, the more we wear and tear it, and we can't really find a way of repaying back that wear and tear. So therefore, what we should do is try to. Wear and tear ourselves. Now we should think of this example that wear and tear doesn't necessarily mean you know tear ourselves up. It means you know、um, giving back to society a part of ourselves and working hard and contributing. So we should do this through our actions by being selfless. And you know part of the beauty of of some of the things in the world is that、um, it is worn and torn. You know forts, castles, that sort of thing. But we appreciate them because they have. Given something to our to our world, and in the same way, we should be able to give back、um, something to to the world. I think、um, there's an example here which is quite interesting、um, that Guruji gives, and it's an example of when he was at college as a child, and they'd all gone to the seaside、um, on a picnic. And they were about 17 or 18 years old, and there were about 30 or 35 students. And it was about lunchtime, and there were some construction workers working on the side. And one of the students thought it, you know, he was getting up to mischief, and he thought that it would be quite funny to steal the construction workers' shoes. And so Guruji said to them, "Well, rather than steal their shoes, why don't you give me one rupee each?" So everybody was there, the obviously 30 people, and they had 30 to 35 rupees, and they took one rupee from everybody and put 
the one rupee in the in the shoe of the construction workers. But the construction workers were working inside the houses, and they hadn't come out. So when they came out, they um, you know, Guruji quickly came back and they were all watching when the construction workers came out. So they put their feet, you know, they, um, they put their feet into their shoes and it was lunchtime and they started to feel something funny in their feet, wondering, what on earth is this in my shoe? And they could feel the coins. So one construction worker pulled out the coin and said, oh, I've got a rupee in my shoe. And then he said, oh, hang on, I've got another one. And slowly, slowly, the, all of them started to realise that they had a rupee in their shoe. But they couldn't figure out why on earth they had this. And they all started getting really happy, thinking that, wow, we've got the, these rupees, it must be some sort of miracle. And um, Guruji then at that point said to his friends, look, isn't it really nice that rather than stealing their shoes, we find pleasure in seeing that they're this happy that they've got, you know, um, that they seem to think that this is a miracle. So therefore, by seeing other people happy, we gain a, a different type of happiness. Don't necessarily, you know, we're not happy when we steal from other people, and we're not happy when we purge things from other people. We should do things as a sacrifice. So your one rupee in this example will go, but that's, you know, not really a big deal. It's one rupee, and so many other people got so much happiness. This type of fun is a completely different thing. The Upanishads ask a very clear question. Idam dhanam gasyasi. And that means, whose wealth is this? And the answer is, it is nobody's, and it will be anybody, and it will not be anybody's. Don't have this type of mentality. And the word they use for the mentality that we shouldn't have is gruddha. And think I say it very nicely because the words gruddha and buddha have the same phonetic sounds, but they're completely opposite in their meanings. So buddha means enlightened, as we know, and gruddha means vulture. So there are two types of people in the world, one who takes and has the vulture mentality, as vultures do, and those that are enlightened, like buddha. The word for vulture in Sanskrit is gruddha. And Latin took this word, gruddha, into gid, and eventually made it into the English word greed. If you leave greed, then only then can you become enlightened. So you've got the two opposite meanings there. From giving something, your own amount increases. So, can I interrupt you? Would you mind to repeat that part, please? When sure. you leave up the greed, then you can become enlightened? If you, so the word for vulture in Sanskrit is gruddha, and in Latin... Um, we took that word and turned it into gid, and then from that we made it um, into English greed. So what we're saying is that we shouldn't have greed, and therefore we'll be enlightened, so we shouldn't keep everything to ourselves. Um, so if you leave only this, then you can become enlightened. From giving something to another person, your own amount increases, and this is actually like a dynamic exchange that happens. So if you qu sit quietly and think about this type of concept, you know, the relationships in the world happen from give and take. You know, often we hear a bit of give and take makes the world go round. So if you give and take and give and take, it's a dynamic exchange that keeps happening. And there's a constant flow of energy there in this universe. So if you take something and then you give something, there's an energy flow. And our willingness to give um, that which we seek will keep the abundance of the universe circulating in our lives. So we should give what we want. So for example, it's quite difficult to give something, you know, chocolates that we love the most, it's really hard to give those because we kind of want to keep them for ourselves. But actually, what we should do is give those chocolates that we love the most to others. You know, um, there's a very good example of this from Sri Krishna's life. Um, Naraji came to Dwarka and um, he gave and all the queens gave something to him. So one queen gave gold, another gave silver, another gave um, myrrh, another person gave sweets. But Satyabhana um, said, who was Krishna Bhagwan's wife, said that she would give Krishna. Now that might seem strange to us because we would say, why would you do that? But Satyabhana said that she wants to do this because she wants Krishna throughout all her life. And it's a rule that if you give what you want, then you will get it then back again. So... Therefore, give the good chocolates that you like, and then you'll get those back. Um, if we give away what we want, then we keep the abundance of the universe circulating in our lives. So anything that is of value will multiply when it's given. And when you hold so but when you hold on to something dearly, it doesn't necessarily then multiply. There's a very famous quote from the Bible where Christ says, He who holds on to something will have it taken from him, but he who gives it away will have it rained down on him. Therefore, it's the same concept again. He who holds on to something creates a disturbance in the laws of the universe. Imagine that a river is f flowing in front of someone's house, and that person wants to block it and keep everything to himself. Then no one further along the street will get the benefit of the river's water. He'll create a block in the river, and no water from the river can go ahead. That block will continue, 
and the water will overflow and it will burst into that person's house so that they have so much water they don't know what to do with it. This, you know, this is an example of how we should keep the river of, and the water flowing. If after we feel that we've decreased the amount once we've given something, we should then think that we haven't given anything at all. Because if a person feels satisfied after giving something away, then that's truly the concept of giving something away. If the giver and taker are both happy, then this, you know, both are satisfied, and that's considered to be true charity. Not when you give something away, you wish that you hadn't given it away and that you'd kept it for yourself. This is how it should actually be, and that's again the free flow of energy between giving and, and taking. It's a law of the universe that as long as you will be giving, you will be receiving. And as you receive more, your ability to give more will also increase. Thinkers show a very simple rule about if you want to have happiness in life. The rule is never go to somebody's house empty-handed. I mean, this used to be a really old rule in our culture that, you know, you never go to anybody's house without taking anything. Um, you know, I used to live in Italy and there, you, you never go to anyone's house without taking anything, even if it's the smallest thing, a packet of biscuits, um, you know, and often um, if, if you like, like to make a particular thing, that you make that and then take it to their house. And that's quite a nice concept in a way because you're sharing a part of something of, that you enjoy with them. You should think about what they would like and take that as well. You know, if you can't necessarily afford anything, then maybe just a flower or a card. Um, if you don't have that much money, then perhaps make your own card and write what you feel about that person. And, you know, this is a beautiful thing, a beautiful small thing that you can do. Um, and people will feel that this is also a part of charity by giving something. Adi Shankaracharya gives an example of a thief as someone who makes the wrong use of the god's wealth. Garaha evasa devadis svapahari. So this is someone who takes the wrong use of God's wealth. This is because whatever's come into your life has come in because of the gods. And a thief has misappropriated the wealth of gods. He has misappropriated God's wealth. And the, the commentator Kesavji says, the word ste that Sri Krishna used for the word, um, the purpose, meaning that a thief gets the punishment of, of a thief. So basically, you know, that makes us wonder what does the punishment, you know, what type of punishment does the thief get? The first thing is that the wealth that he has often gets taken back away from him. It takes, you know, he loses it. And this is sort of the first thing. But the second thing is that he then loses the right to that wealth in the same way that God's given wealth to someone in life. And if he doesn't use that wealth to help society and promote it, um, such a person will be punished like a thief. All his wealth will be taken away because that person doesn't befit the wealth. And that person's not right for the wealth. So this person will then get punished. Shankar Naranji has also gone further and says that a person will incur sin if he's stolen a Brahmin or God's wealth. And this type of person forgets the person who gives something to him. If you don't call him a thief, then what else really can you call that person? The feeling of giving away is instinctive in human beings. We enjoy sharing and we gain pleasure from that. So when someone gives our, chocolate, um, when someone gives our children chocolate, then we often say... You know, you should say thank you to that uncle or you should say thank you to that person who's given us chocolate. And therefore, we should have the same feelings of thank you to the person who's given us all our wealth, which is God. If we think about this verse in the Gita, then we learn what's missing from modern thoughts. We learn that, you know, in modern economics, we learn how to, um, to earn money, but not necessarily how to use an, the money that we have and how to, how to spend that money in the correct way and how we've accumulated it. That's not necessarily taught. And that's what's missing from modern education. You know, often if you read an, an The Economist or you read an article from any economical, you know, economics magazine, it will show you how to save wealth and how to increase your wealth, but it won't necessarily show you how to correctly use your wealth um, in the world. Therefore, you know, there's a little bit of lack of peace, you know, and our scriptures have shown us that we need to engage in charity and to share with others. And that's an example of making good use of the wealth. Often, people get trampled by their own wealth, and that's exactly what's frequently happening nowadays. People have, you know, so much money that they're not sure what to do with it, and they get squashed from inside, not really knowing what to do. They spend money on this thing and that thing, but actually, they don't know how to share it and enjoy it, really. Our issues have, our issues have discussed a way in which Lakshmi, which is wealth, will never really go away. They've showed us how to earn wealth and show us how to use that wealth for correct purposes. Whenever there's wealth, we should use it for good purposes. And there's an example of a king in Shaurastra who came to the throne at a very young age. He was about 25 or 26. 
and he had a very, very generous heart. And his people used to always come to him and say, oh, you know, I need some money for this, I need some money for that, I'm really struggling. And he was very generous. So they all came to him to ask for help. And the king used to ask him, you know, um, the king used to often give them things with both hands, saying, take this, take that. And whatever they asked for, the king would give them. So after three years, the royal treasury, treasury was slowly becoming empty. The prime minister, who was in that town, was about 70 years, 70 years old, and he had experienced life. And the prime minister came and told the king to, you know, to clench his fist a little bit and not to share as many things as, as he had. And the king asked, well, why should I do this, you know? Um, and the prime minister said, well, I can start to see the bottom of our treasury, and if you keep giving, then we'll slowly run out. And the king said, well, how can I do this? There's so many people here that want to, um, you know, that need my help, that I feel that I should help them. Um, you know, how can I refrain from helping these people? And the prime minister talked about his life experiences and told the king that wherever there is jaggery, which is sweet, um, then bees will always come there. And the king remembered this sentence. So he sent a man at midnight to go and wake the prime minister up and to bring the prime minister to him. So the man went along, woke up the prime minister, and the prime minister asked, why has the king woke me up in the middle of the night? And in one of the rooms in the palace, the king had prepared a plate of this jaggery and put a cover cloth on it. And he'd asked the prime minister to open up the cover. So the prime minister came along and removed the cover. And the king said, king asked the prime minister to tell him what was under the cloth. And the prime minister said, well, there's jaggery there, there's, you know, this sweet gur. And the king asked where the bees were. And the Prime Minister replied, well, how is it possible for the bees to be here in the middle of the night? And the King then reminded the Prime Minister that he had said, whenever there's jaggery, there'll always be bees. So the Prime Minister said, it's true, but wherever there is jaggery, there will always be bees, but the sun must be shining in order for there to be, um, in order for this jaggery to be there. And that's exactly, and the King said, that's exactly what I'm trying to say. As long as the sun is shining on me, then I should give as much as I can, so that when the sun sets, on my life, the jaggery will stay exactly the same and the bees will not come here. One who doesn't do this is considered to be a thief by Sri Krishna.